We welcome you all to today's webinar titled Mental Health Needs Among Youth Involved in Juvenile Justice, Prevalence, Puzzles, and Responses. And for those of you who aren't familiar with us here at CJCA, uh, we are the membership organization representing the youth correctional CEOs in 50 states, Puerto Rico, and also some major metropolitan counties. And CJCA was awarded a grant from the John D. and Catherine T. MacArthur Foundation to establish the resource network for youth corrections leaders and professionals to sustain and expand knowledge developed through the Models for Change Reform Initiative. The resource network is designed to transfer knowledge through training, networking, and strategic site-based training and technical assistance grants. And the components of this resource network include uh, the CJCA Leadership Institute, which is an annual meeting of state agency directors and happens to be coming up in less than two weeks from today on October 1st in Chicago. Uh, there have also been four training and technical assistance grants that have been awarded this year in areas of mental health curriculum, improving outcomes for dual status youth, and progress in evidence-based screening and assessment. Um, of course, as part of the network, we're offering a series of webinars, as you see here today. Uh, these presentations, along with a series of open forum discussions, um, we've really been getting a lot of participation in these webinars and we're excited to tell you that we've got over 500 people registered for today's event and I think the volume of registrants just really speaks to how incredibly important today's topic of addressing mental health needs is to our field. The CJCA also out of this resource network has established an online hub or an online social network for juvenile justice professionals. We're calling this our CJCA Affiliate Membership Program, and we're excited to announce that we just launched this recently. Uh, as CJCA, uh, this program is aimed to connect members of juvenile justice and youth corrections at every level. So just as CJCA has brought the CEOs of state youth corrections organizations together over the last 20 years, we hope that through this new Affiliate Membership Program, we can do the same for juvenile justice and youth correction staff. So you can view the CJCA website, which is cjca.net, for more information about joining our affiliate, affiliate membership program. And I've actually seen a few of our affiliate members are already on in the presentation here today, so thank you for joining. My name is Brendan Donahue, and I'm the technology manager here at CJCA. And before I hand things over to today's panelists, I just want to quickly point out some functions of the webinar. We use GoToWebinar is our webinar software that we're delivering the presentation here to you today. You have an option to listen to today, today's presentation through your computer speakers, or you can also call in by the telephone. My advice to you here is just that if you are calling in by the telephone, make sure that you have the telephone option selected on your screen. So you should have this webinar control panel on the right-hand side of your screen, and just make sure you have the appropriate audio option selected. If you're experiencing uh, echo, it's quite possible that you might have both audio options running at the same time. So again, if you've called in on the telephone, choose the telephone option. Also, if you're having choppy or poor audio uh, due to a slow internet connection, I also suggest you use that telephone option and that'll help with the audio. Uh, we're going to be taking questions uh, at any point during the presentation here, but we're really going to have time at the end to do some Q&A with our panelists. Uh, but you can type in those questions to us at any point by using the questions panel uh, on the same control panel that I mentioned earlier. So towards the bottom of the screen, you can type in questions at any point. If we can't stop and answer them as we go, we'll be sure to leave time at the end. Today's webinar will be recorded and archived for future viewing, so if you want to go back and watch the presentation, you'll be able to do so. And as always, we'll make available the slides so that you can have a copy of these slides. And we'll follow up with emails on any other resources that are mentioned during the presentation. So if there's anything here that we show you on the screen here today, uh, we'll make sure that we can send you a link or a way to download that in a future email. Uh, you should see any of these handouts or uh, the follow-up emails in your inbox sometime next week. All right, so I think I've covered just about everything to get us started. So I'm going to turn things over to today's panelists. Uh, today you're going to hear from uh, Robert Kincher. Uh, Robert is a clinical forensic psychologist and attorney who currently serves as senior associate at the National Center for Mental Health and Juvenile Justice. Uh, for the center, Dr. Kinsher has been involved in MacArthur Models for Change initiatives, as well as initiatives with the Council of State Governments, SAMHSA, OJJDP, and the National Council for Juvenile and Family Court Judges. He also serves at the Massachusetts School of Professional Psychology 
as a senior administrator and member of the teaching faculty for a doctoral clinical psychology program. Uh, you're also going to hear today from Dr. Yvonne Sparling. Yvonne is the Director of Clinical Services for the Massachusetts Department of Youth Services. Dr. Sparling has been with the department for over 25 years and the Director of Clinical Services for over 12 years. Dr. Sparling's pr primary focus has been to develop integrated treatment systems, establish the use of dialectic behavior therapy across the board of continuum of services, and implement gender-specific services for young women who have been committed to the department. Recently, Dr. Sparling has worked on the following initiatives, increasing family engagement, implementing federal standards on risk assessment, and incorporating policies within the department to support LGBTQI uh, youth. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to our first panelist, Dr. Robert Kincher. Robert? Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here uh, and particularly to address uh, a topic of such importance and interest to people uh, in the field across the country. Um, we're first going to take a look at some of the data regarding the prevalences of mental disorders uh, amongst young people. Uh, from time to time I may refer to the term behavioral health disorders. Uh, that is a term that is an increasing use in uh, SAMHSA and uh, other federal agencies and by behavioral health disorders, we simply mean the combination of the mental health disorders and the substance use disorders, sometimes known as co-occurring disorders. One of the most consistent findings across multiple sites uh, and over the years has been the very high prevalence of youth with mental disorders uh, in contact with the juvenile justice system. Uh, in general, the deeper youth penetrate into the juvenile justice system, um, the higher the prevalence and also the greater the functional impact or acuity of the mental disorders as they get into the system deeper and deeper. As you can see, these are uh, four studies. These were done at different places at different times, and they came up with uh, remarkably similar findings, uh, a positive diagnosis, uh, one or more positive diagnosis for roughly uh, 67 to 70 percent of young people in contact with the juvenile justice system. This breakout is by gender and is from the study conducted in 2006 by the National Center for Mental Health and Juvenile Justice. It found an overall prevalence rate of 70.4% of youth having any diagnosis, with females, uh, probably not surprisingly, having a um, higher prevalence than did males. There were high rates of anxiety disorders, overall about 34 percent, but with significantly higher rates amongst females. This is probably because, although the study didn't break it out quite this uh, clearly, it's probably because that under the DSM system at the time, post-traumatic stress disorder was uh, grouped as an anxiety disorder, and we know that there are higher rates of victimization amongst females than males, and we believe that probably that uh, almost two times elevation of females over males represents greater histories of, of victimization or exposure to other adversities. Mood disorders, also uh, higher amongst females than males. That would also be consistent with the general finding of higher rates of mood disorder like depression amongst adolescent girls and adolescent boys in community samples, although these are much higher rates than you would see in uh, general community samples. Interestingly enough, one would expect to see a fairly high representation of youth with disruptive disorders uh, in juvenile justice populations, especially conduct disorder. Um, if you look at the criteria for conduct disorder, it's essentially a list of indictable felonies with a small cluster of status offenses at the bottom. And in order to get a diagnosis of conduct disorder, you have to have committed uh, three of them in the past year and one within the past six months. So it's really a way of describing versatile delinquency. And one would think that there would be a, a high prevalence of this uh, in the juvenile justice system. And there's a high prevalence, um, 
But even amongst the highest, which was found amongst girls, interestingly enough, it's only around 50%. Um, this is interesting because conduct disorder accounts for about 50% of outpatient treatment referrals amongst adolescents in the United States. Substance use disorders, not surprisingly, uh, quite high and higher than a diagnosable substance abuse disorder um, amongst uh, community populations. Please note that under the DSM system, at the time of the research, uh, mere use of a substance, like recreational use of alcohol or marijuana, would not have warranted a substance use disorder. So these are kids who are being impaired by their uh, level of use in their lives. Not surprisingly, but of great concern, is that more than half of the youth in this study met criteria for at least two diagnoses, and six out of ten of youth with a mental disorder also had a substance use disorder, suggesting that um, our systems need to be thinking about accommodating themselves to, I don't know whether it was an old uh, normal or it's a new normal, but certainly their presence of co-occurring disorders needs to be considered. Um, this has implications for how we structure our services, since many of our services focus upon uh, mental disorders or substance use disorders, but very rarely are integrated co-occurring disorders. Also of concern, about 27% of those youth have disorders that are serious enough to require immediate and significant treatment. This kind of prevalence has led many to suggest that the juvenile justice system has increasingly become the default de facto juvenile mental health system, particularly for youth who cannot access care or they access more traditional models of clinical care which are not effective in engaging them. As a result, they're more likely to be uh, detained and uh, adjudicated and placed into systems where those needs, uh, at least theoretically, are being more consistently addressed. We know that there are higher overrepresentations of disorders, especially as we go into the deeper ends of juvenile justice settings, such as uh, secure treatment settings. I would just draw your attention to borderline IQ and mild MR. Uh, there is research that suggests that roughly 10 to 12 percent of youth in contact with the juvenile justice system um, post arraignment and in detention and juvenile secure settings um, uh, have borderline IQ to mild MR. This has important implications for how we think of working with them since a lot of psychotherapies are verbal um, in nature um, and require the ability to do things like uh, workbooks uh, or to uh, generalize information from treatment settings outside of those contexts. Just briefly, it, more information to suggest that there are youth who are penetrating the juvenile justice system uh, in order to uh, access mental health needs um, and because of the lack of access to the right kinds of mental health services in communities. So we know that we have a high prevalence of youth. We know that we have a high prevalence of youth with mental disorders and substance use disorders. Um, and we know that it is often difficult to sort out co-occurring comorbidity amongst adolescents, probably more difficult than doing the same task with adults because uh, youth are on a developmental trajectory and how their mental disorder may present can change over time as they mature. It is also difficult to uh, often place a kid in an ecological context and see how the features of a mental disorder may manifest themselves or play out, especially if you are uh, getting to know this child, evaluating this child away from their family or their community in a detention or secure treatment facility. I'm going to focus for just a moment on one of uh, the most significant puzzles, and that is the um, challenge posed by trauma, since trauma in adolescents and young adults can present in so many different ways. I like to think of it as kind of a clinical chameleon, where uh, it often takes a great deal of persistence and skill to uh, understand clinically what you have on your hands with a youth. This 
challenge is further complicated by the fact that the DSM-4 and DSM-5 systems, while they include trauma-related disorders like acute stress disorder or PTSD, it has, they have not yet incorporated research on the developmental trauma disorder presentation that would fall short of a classic presentation of PTSD. But I ask you to think with me a little bit about the available DSM diagnostic categories related to stress and trauma, and then look at uh, the dis clinical description of a proposed developmental trauma disorder and think about how many of these might fit youth uh, that you work with in your setting. One of the problems in formulating this is that symptoms are often nonspecific, meaning they can be found in a number of diagnoses. For example, difficulty with attention and concentration could be ADHD, but it might be depression or it might be part of a picture of an emerging psychotic disorder. Sometimes symptoms are difficult to distinguish. The difference, for example, between inattention and hypervigilance mood instability from trauma and mood instability from a mood disorder, especially an emerging bipolar disorder, or distinguishing the psychological numbing that arises from trauma from that that may come from depression. So what we want to try and do is capture what many of us are increasingly coming to believe are a subthreshold group of trauma-related diagnoses that don't quite make PTSD and whose clinical picture is complicated by co-occurring psychiatric or substance use disorders. It is probably best with these youth, especially where we don't have a, uh, an accepted uh, set of, of nosology in the DSM system, to focus upon the function of behavior and the presentation and function of symptoms of behavioral health disorders and avoid unhelpful diagnoses like oppositional defiant disorder or conduct disorder that really tell us nothing about how these uh, presentations uh, emerged or the social context in which they emerged or clear direction for intervening uh, with individual youth. So the devo proposed developmental trauma disorder, uh, its threshold criteria is multiple or chronic exposure to one or more forms of developmentally adverse interpersonal trauma. Think about this list in the parentheses and the youth that you have uh, been working with in your uh, facilities or in your setting. This exposure is paired with a subjective experience, rage, betrayal, fear, resignation, defeat, or shame. At the heart of a developmental trauma disorder is a triggered pattern of repeated dysregulation in response to trauma cues. Those trauma cues may be internal, that is to say they may be uh, intrusive memories of traumatic or stressful events, they may be external, things that they see, smell, hear, experience that may uh, remind them of their trauma exposure. And what we note with this is that uh, these cueings result in persisting dysregulations and a very slow return to uh, their baseline. Um, there are often an odd or complicated mix of mood symptoms, um, somatic bodily symptoms, behavioral symptoms such as reenactments of portions of the trauma, uh, cutting in efforts to uh, self-regulate and the like, impact on cognition, uh, believing it is happening again or could, sometimes uh, leading to uh, uh, hypervigilance and um, overperception of threat, but also confusion, dissociation, and experiences of depersonalization. Relational disturbances and volatility uh, beyond the norm already seen in adolescents as they uh, are, are moving through that period of their life, but uh, clinginess, oppositional, distrustful, compliant, and often many of these same things in the same child uh, across relationships and across time. Self-hate and self-blame, which sometimes manifest itself and self-sabotaging or putting themselves in situations where they risk harming themselves as well as others or being harmed. I think we see a lot of these in the youth with whom we work. Negative self-attribution. Uh, they distrust people who would reasonably be seen as attempting to protect them or take care of them. 
They lose trust that they can expect protection by others. They lose trust in social agencies, such as the police, the courts, even uh, their own communities, and sometimes their own families to protect them. They don't believe that their experience will be validated or that they will receive for their own experiences when they've been victimized social justice. Uh, they believe that they will um, need to take care of their own retribution because they cannot rely on courts, police, or others to protect them and uh, engage in just ret retribution. And unfortunately, they inevitably, they often believe that fu their future victimization is inevitable and begin to adapt to that belief as well. Uh, that probably maps pretty closely onto the PTSD symptom of a sense of foreshortened future in which they uh, have difficulty imagining themselves um, in realistic futures other than being uh, incarcerated or dead. This dysregulation, these cognitive and social and affective uh, uh, challenges result in functional impairments and for many of the young people in your setting, they probably have impairments on multiple of these domains. So there are a variety of different responses that we can consider. Uh, we're going to have Dr. Sparling uh, build upon this to talk about the experience of the Massachusetts Department of Youth Services. However, uh, she's going to be mapping out one piece of the system, a key piece from police contact all the way through deeper ends of the uh, juvenile justice system. Um, it, it will be important to identify and respond to the individual needs of these youth. Uh, this often requires thinking through systems of screening and assessment. For more information on screening and assessment, you can uh, go to the link for the MacArthur Models for Change website and look at a variety of monographs on that issue. Uh, similarly, the website at the National C Center for Mental Health and Juvenile Justice. And at this point, um, Dr. Sparling is going to tell you about the experience of the Massachusetts Department of Youth Services. Um, thank you, folks, for your interest in uh, this topic. Robert uh, clearly described many of the youth that come into our agency. And really, we went to uh, dialectical behavior therapy because we felt that so many of our youth had significant trauma, and they had a lot of the experiences that Robert described. So at this point, DBT is a primary clinical and behavioral approach used in DYS. It fits very well with positive youth development model. And we're really able to utilize DBT because the department has a long history of providing support to youth and the belief that supporting youth allows them to reach their full potential. So we first, uh, DBT was developed by Marsha Linehan in 1993. We initially uh, did a pilot in 1999. Uh, I will describe uh, some of the effects of the pilot and some of the modifications that we did. And in 2009, uh, we worked with all our providers so that it became the uh, primary method of um, rehabilitation across the continuum. So if you're familiar with DBT, it was really designed for adults. And what we've done in the manual is we have really modified the skills to really meet the needs of kids in juvenile justice. So for instance, if a kid is in the detention setting, a mindfulness skill would be helpful to them. And we talk about when they go back before the judge, how can they maintain themselves in a way that's in their best interest, so that we really try to tie it across the continuum. A DBT really is a therapy that focuses on teaching self-regulation skills, how to be calm, how to set goals, how to interact with others. And really, it's a cognitive behavioral approach to try to understand the connection between one's thoughts, feelings, and actions. So before um, I talk more about DBT, I want to talk a little bit about how we've incorporated it in our training. Um, MacArthur Foundation recommends LS brain development when you consider that when you're designing treatment approaches. And we have, and we have that very much a part of our basic training. We're fortunate that we are able, for all staff that's working in our agency, to have 40 hours of training uh, before they start onto the unit. 
Part of that is on DBT, part of that also on de-escalation, part of suicide prevention. Then they go to the units for a week, and then they come back, and it's another 40-week training. So a part of that, I'm going to just share a few slides from that initial training. We talk a lot about brain development. Uh, it fits very much with what Robert was talking about in terms of youth who have had a history of trauma are very quick to go into a fight or flight response. We talk about you know, how visual images come into the visual cortex. It goes up to the amygdala. And uh, while it can go to the thalamus where you can stop and reason, that part of the brain really is, uh, continues to develop until young adulthood. And what we find with our kids is that's the fight and flight response is what they have overlearned. And a lot of times they've needed to overlearn that because they've been in traumatic environments, and that's been very adaptive. But at this point, they, it's almost second nature to them, and they don't always understand it. Uh, Daniel Goldman talks about emotional hijacking. It's when really the impulsive feelings override the rational thought, and you can react prior to recognition, which ties in with what Robert was saying, so that if they've had that early trauma, they will have built-in cues that they respond to that they may not understand either. So maybe in a... Um, on a unit, if there's a really tall staff member, and if they have been victimized, you know, by adult men before, they have an instant reaction to that, or even tones of voice, or so that they are very quick to go into a, what they believe is a justified pattern of behavior that's highly impulsive, so that we really are trying to teach them that basic skill. And so the repeated trauma in childhood and overreaction of fight and flight. And when really CDBT skills are taught to really help you learn to focus attention so that they're able to decide on an action rather than act impulsively. So a lot of what we do is not all skills work for all kids. But it's a real sense that these are some basic skills that you can use to meet your own goals. Uh, we first I'm going to talk a little bit about our own internal research on DBT and kind of how we've gotten to it. Uh, presently, we have it on all 56 residential programs in DYS, both the state programs and the provider programs. We all use the manual. The manual was developed by a number of people. We have uh, shift supervisors who help contribute to it. And um, it had this wide acceptance because of, I think, the early research that we did. And, uh, our first pilot was in 1999. Again, we had a number of girls who were self-cutting, who had um, uh, a history of being highly um, damaging to themselves, whether it was in the community and they ran from placement, whether it was being aggressive, or whether it was the, the cutting. So that we had one group of girls that were learning the DBT. We had a control group. And after three months, we found the girls that were in the DBT had fewer timeouts fewer restraints. They had done higher on the behavioral level system. And what was especially nice was that their families really appreciated the DBT. Because a part of when we did DBT, we always tell kids that not all skills work for all kids, and not all skills work in all situations. But every week, there's a skill of the week, and there's homework that I'll be describing, and they practice it with their advocate. And it's really, if you find a skill that's helpful, then tell your parents, tell your caseworker, tell your advocate, and practice it. So the parents would come in and say, hey, they're talking about these skills. So we found that it was really, uh, it was a way to integrate treatment. Uh, we were lucky, Sandy Bromberg uh, was the director of the Brockton Girls Detention Program. And in 2003, she trained staff on DBT. And in the year after, all staff were trained in DBT, they had a 75% reduction in the number of restraints which the program contributed to, they thought it was a DBT. Then in 2001, Dr. Ken Rogers, he um, is a psychologist, works in the Boston Metro program, and he tried a DBT mindfulness groups for boys in detention. And as um, probably most of you know, detention, a lot of kids are in and out, and in no time he realized that he couldn't have 10 kids in the mindfulness group in the 10 control, kids went and had an extra gym. So all the staff were saying, you know, we can't get, we won't be able to get the kids in group if, if they're going to miss gym. But they, they persisted. And the fact that kids were in and out, it just became, okay, 
this side of a hall, who's ever in these 10 bedrooms, these 10 kids will do the DBT, and these 10 on the other side will um, go to the, have an extra gym. They did it for six months. They had the, the data. At that point, we did point level systems. We gave it to our um, Rob Tansy, who analyzes our data. And uh, sure enough, the kids that had the DB, the boys that had the DBT, had more significant improvement in behavioral level systems than the kids that had been in the other room. And then finally, in 2003, Dr. Linda Watt is a psychologist, and she worked on our Southeast um, DBT program. She was working um, with a student on her um, PhD thesis. And again, they did DBT school groups with boys in a locked security treatment center. And the locus of control was the measure they used. And again, the boys in the DBT felt they had more sense of hope and more sense of control for the future. Uh, this was the point then in 2009 we worked with our providers and we decided to endorse it across. Presently, we have uh, an independent research team studying the effects of DBT on DYS youth. Uh, uh, kids are in secure treatment. They are doing uh, pre and post testing, and there's been uh, a decrease in aggression, both verbal and physical, as well as anger. And they are uh, also measuring it with their own, the kids' um, views on the different DBT cells they're using. Prior, it's somewhat more difficult to do a study now because we since we're using it in all our programs, we don't have a natural control group. So what we're doing is it's, we're comparing uh, use both your pre and post uh, measures. But uh, we continue to think that it's, it's been working for our kids. Uh, ever, ever so slightly, I will just describe the four modules. Mindfulness module are the skills focused on gaining control of attention so the youth can choose action. That's a lot of the deep breathing, that counting backwards. It's very um, uh, skills they practice again, and we start that in our detention program. As Robert said, we have um, kids in our system that we hold for detention, and they go back to court, and they may or may not be committed to us. If they're committed to us, they come back, and they're in our assessment centers, where they also uh, are being taught mindfulness and stress tolerance. And if they um, following a 30, 45 day assessment period, they will go on a residential program. And there they will be working on emotion regulation skills. And what's helped with some of those skills will really help them get to talk about some of the trauma. But we wait until they have some basic skills before we work on those issues. Interpersonal effectiveness skills we usually do last. And we can again relate those to when you go back to the community, if you're back in school, how can you get your needs met without being aggressive? If you, are, if you have a job, if you have a problem with your coworker, how can you uh, design a situation that you can get and not get fired or get someone else fired? How can you really learn to have a cooperative relationship? And those are the skills that we teach uh, as they are transitioning back. And again, it's a basic DBT skill. Um, but DBT, uh, we've integrated with our other therapy groups. We naturally do sex offender groups or violent offender groups. We do substance abuse treatment groups. Uh, substance abuse prevention groups, and again, relapse prevention groups. And again, we just see DBT as like the basic skills that they really need to uh, learn to understand so they can figure out what's triggering them. They can have a better understanding of uh, cues, internal cues, and then uh, more self-control so they can choose action. Um, we use DBT in our basic training, as I said. We have um, 40 hours of basic training. DBT is uh, within our the escalation techniques that we work on. We use it to decrease room confinement, again, enhancing youth advocate relationships and our suicide prevention. Um, again, as I said, we use DBT across all levels of programming. We have skill sheets uh, so that there's a skill of the week. Everyone on the unit knows that. And um, as kids first come in, they do a distress tolerance coping plan. If we have time, I can describe it. But, and that's something that they do with the advocate. Advocates are um, all used in our program have an assigned clinician, an assigned advocate. An advocate is um, a, a line staff. I don't know there's different terms for them. But either way, they have a relationship with the youth, and they work with them on their coping plans. Because we feel like everyone contributes to a youth uh, gaining these skills. And it's um, 
we want kids to know from the time they come in, we think you have some skills, we're going to be teaching you more skills, and that's just really an expectation. And uh, we also use the DBT skills for conflict resolution. Uh, we use behavior chains. Many of you may be familiar with behavior chains. It really looks at the basic cognitive behavioral approach that really links feelings, thoughts, and action. So what um, uh, it's across settings, so when you have difficulties, what are the similarities, what thoughts can you use to help gain more self-control. We use DBT diary cards. Those are cards, and it really the youth keeps track of their own goals, and um, they keep track of what skills help them reach their goals. There's homework sheets. Every uh, DBT skill in the manual that we have, we have um, guidelines on how to teach the skill and we have several different types of homework uh, to practice that skill. And that we ask the advocate to work with the role plays with the kids on these skills. Another um, aspect of DBT is repair and repair status. It's just basically that you need uh, to acknowledge when you've made a mistake, you need to learn how to apologize, and you need to rectify the misdeeds. And that's been really helpful as we uh, reduce room confinement, because with room confinement, at one point, we would use room confinement for noncompliance, but we felt that a lot of the work that Lindsay Hayes talked about in terms of the um, completed suicides in juvenile justice unfortunately happened when kids were in locked rooms. So at this point, with a room confinement, we will only put kids in a locked room if they're a danger uh, to someone else, and they are monitored and quickly taken out of the room. So we don't use it for noncompliance. We do use repair status so that uh, we have a large incentive program. So let's say if you're on a level that you have pizza Thursday night and that you have um, done a misdeed, if you were inappropriate, if there's something that's happened on the unit that would put you on repair status, you maintain your level, but you don't uh, receive the incentives of that level until you've made your repair. So that um, it's a way that kids can learn that you um, can acknowledge you can make things right and then get back to the regular programming. At one point, we had kids, you'd lose a level and it would take weeks to get back. Now it's just that uh, we really focus on more their understanding of what they've done wrong. Um, just ever so briefly, I talked about, we talk about UAS coaching protocol. Um, we really have staff focus both on their own thoughts and feelings. Let's say if there's, an, if you see two kids, that appear to be having difficulty on the unit. One of the things that we really train on for staff is first focus on yourself, catch your own breath, be aware of how you're feeling. Because if you run into the situation loud, it's only like you know oil on fire. So you really try to have them learn to focus and self-regulate, learn to assess the situation. We talk a lot about validation, and I know that Robert talked about that in his remarks too. So that let a youth, even if they've misperceived a situation, just to be able to talk about it allows them to, to gain some emotional control. Then you can later say, you know, I don't really think that that number was being disrespectful. But if you start there, then the kid is constantly feeling like, oh, no, no, it really was, so that you let them kind of um, de-escalate and share their emotions first. You offer suggestions, and you always reinforce. We talk about reinforce a lot. It's easy if you if you've succeeded on a task, you can feel pretty good yourself about it. What you need to reinforce when kids have tried something, they haven't maybe been successful, because that's when they need the reinforcement, and we really talk about that a lot. And lastly, in order to try to keep consistency, which is always a challenge across all 56 programs, we have regional DBT coaches. And they can provide staff training. They assist in clinical groups. All of our um, clinicians within six months of hire, we ask them to go through the DBT online uh, licensing through uh, behavioral tech. And the DBT coaches can also monitor our programs. So um, that's kind of how we use DBT in a nutshell. And Robert and I are both here for any questions. Great, and thank you both. And we've got questions coming in. And of course, remember that you can type in your questions on the webinar control panel. Uh, if you don't see that control panel, towards the top right corner of your screen, 
Uh, there's a little bar that sticks out with an orange button with a white arrow. If it's pointing to the left, that'll help pull the control panel out from the side of the screen, and you'll be able to type in your questions. Um, so while I've got some questions in here, I'm actually going to see if I can go all the way back towards the beginning of the presentation. We talked about prevalence of uh, mental health disorders, and one of the first questions that we got was, um, do you, are you aware of any research or info in regards to the prevalence of the autism spectrum disorders? Um, I'm not aware of uh, research that has been published off the top of my head. Uh, in some of the earlier studies, uh, the sort of spectrum disorders were folded in with developmental disability, which was folded in with intellectual disability. So I'm unaware, as I sit here today, of a specific uh, study to refer you to on prevalence over a large number of, of young people. What I can tell you is, anecdotally, um, every place I have gone in the country over the past couple of years, uh, both in the juvenile court setting but also in the juvenile justice setting, people have felt as though they are getting more and more of these young people, uh, particularly um, of what until DSM-5 we would have called the Asperger's uh, syndrome or disorder uh, kind, of, kind of kid. Um, and they do pose uh, different and very significant challenges because most of our uh, intervention technologies were not devised with their social uh, deficits in mind. Uh, I'm aware that there is research underway. I just haven't seen it published yet. Thank you. Um, a lot of questions about CBT and uh, Vaughn and your slides in there, so I want to try and get to a few of those. Uh, one of the first questions I saw was, uh, do you need to have a clinical license uh, to run or oversee the DBT program as designed there? And I think she's wondering about the use in facilities with no clinical personnel on site. Um, uh, I would need to think through that. I can tell you we're fortunate enough that we have clinical directors who are independently licensed so that within our system they and then they're required to go through the DBT online training. But uh, we have worked with behavioral tech folks in terms of our manual, and um, I know that we have lots of staff that help co-facilitate the group that aren't clinically trained because we really feel like that, that's a way for, for everyone to utilize it. But I, I, don't know if, I, don't know how we, I don't know how we might have gotten there without our licensed staff, which is what I know. Yeah, that makes sense. And, and um, how about I get to a few of those questions about uh, the system here, because I think a few people had asked about Massachusetts in particular. Um, for example, you had mentioned that each resident is assigned an advocate to work with them on their homework and other skills. So one of the questions that came up was, what is your ratio of staff to residents? We are very fortunate. An advocate will have more than one use. But we have uh, most of our programs have around uh, 15 uh, residents. We have uh, in that we'll have a licensed clinical director and often we'll have two clinicians. And then on terms of staff ratio, I think we often have uh, teachers on the unit and then we have as many as uh, uh, four line staff. So that we, we are very, very fortunate to have a rich number of adults who can be positive mentors to our kids. Uh, I've got another question about uh, locking youth in their rooms. I think you were f referring to room confinement or, or isolation use. Yes. But um, uh, the, qu the question that I got was, are your rooms locked at night? You said they never lock youth in their rooms. But I think Good was... point. Yes. Uh, they, in our locked secure treatment units, they are locked at night. So yes, that's a good clarifying question. Yeah. Yeah. So I meant in terms of as uh, room confinement, at one point, we would do that for non-compliance, and we don't do that. Something for cause yeah. or punishment yeah. in there, yeah, non-compliant use. Great. Um, and I've actually had a few people ask, I'm going to stick with you, Yvonne, here. Okay. Um, I've had a few people ask about the manual. Uh, is it published, or is that something that is available? I will need to check with my commissioner. We have um, we had worked with, we had gotten permission when we first developed it with Marshall Linehan's group. We, we sent it to them. We're saying, do you think this is CBT? Because we modified it in terms with that lesson. And um, feel free to contact, contact um, 
the Massachusetts Department of Youth Services, because we have shared it with other states. It's just Excellent. Thank you very much. I want to try and share some of the question wealth here. Uh, Robert, I've got a question here that might be more appropriate for you. Is um, Have you ever heard of the term toxic stress? Uh, it seems to be the medical diagnosis for the uh, clinical development trauma disorder that you discussed. So have you heard that term used before? Yes, toxic stress is um, a term that has been increasingly used by uh, people in pediatric medicine and in behavioral uh, development. Um, you can go to the American Academy of Pediatrics um, and they actually have a policy statement on toxic stress and early childhood. Uh, one way of thinking about toxic stress is that uh, it's any one of a number of events, probably no one of which would have had a significant developmental impact on a child, but because of their chronicity or the cumulative number of them, uh, there's reason to believe that this actually begins to alter neural pathways uh, in ways that are kind of the neural underpinnings of the, the emotional dysregulation, the hypervigilance, um, and the like we've been talking about. So that the toxic stress model is probably the neurodevelopmental underpinning for the developmental trauma disorder and its uh, sort of cognitive and emotional um, and social manifestation. If you are, uh, let me just give you a, a resource to think about as well. If you have not already looked at this data, you should go to the website for the Centers for Disease Control and on their internal search, just type in childhood, uh, adverse childhood experiences, uh, ACEs for short. Uh, there is significant research emerging about the correlation between uh, exposure to uh, 10 or 11 adverse childhood experiences and uh, poorer outcomes in a variety of different um, domains that may be relevant for us. Uh, about 18 states now routinely collect data on the ACEs scores, the adverse childhood experiences of youth in various parts of their systems. And the emerging research suggests that the kids who are higher ACEs are more likely to do things like uh, be placed earlier in special education, uh, have more difficulty in school, be the youth that fail on community-based probation, uh, more likely to have a substance use, use problem, try to hurt themselves or somebody else, uh, fail out on supervision in the juvenile justice system, um, and, and have earlier onset of substance use and mental health disorders. Uh, so if you are not collecting data on your youth experiences of exposure to adverse childhood experiences, um, it would be uh, useful to think about that and then to look at that in light of the findings that DBT um, uh, which really kind of anticipates this kind of history uh, is particularly effective uh, with youth and juvenile justice. Thank you. Um, I've got a couple more questions that are kind of similar to what I asked earlier, Vaughn, about um, implementing DBT and who, who can do it there in the facilities. And aside from the clinicians here, you might have addressed this a little bit, but um, can DBT be implemented in facilities that do not have qualified mental health professional staff or do you feel that entry-level staff working in community programs uh, with youth have enough education or experience to use DBT? I, th I think DBT is something that adults, adolescents all can learn. It's really the amount of training that the adults would be willing to be a part of. I mean, it's real basic skills. Obviously, one has to understand the skills to be able to teach it to adolescents. But um, and that's one reason that we ask all our clinicians to go through the, the behavioral tech uh, DBT skill portion. But I think clearly uh, we have line staff that really, really get it, use it, can see it in kids, can reinforce it. And um, it, it's what, difficult getting everyone on board, but once it happens, it's really, uh, it can be very positive for the whole milieu. I've got a question that I've been told I can address to either one of you, but um, <laughs> and maybe we let uh, Robert speak again here. Uh, so the question is, is um, it's from a child psychiatrist, and they do evaluations in a two-week detention center, 
and uh, agreeing that multiple diagnoses are uh, co-occurring aside from medication use, attempting to reduce symptoms. How does DBT look at the interplay between different diagnosis creating systems? And are there any valuable resources to read about how multiple diagnoses promote a common symptom? Um, I'm not sure that I grasp the heart of the question, so, but let me try and formulate a response, and, and uh, Yvonne should, should feel free to jump in. Um, DBT, as I understand it, and I've seen it implemented, sort of assumes that uh, however we want to describe uh, the pathways, uh, whether we think of the emotional dysregulation as coming from trauma or from a treatable depression with mood instability or an emerging bipolar disorder, whatever it might be, um, that in fact the functional problem is the same. In this particular example, the emotional dysregulation. Um, and that equipping people with skills to monitor and manage their own emotional states would be useful no matter what the pathway was. Um, I think um, that with, with kind of that at its core, I think sophisticated differential diagnosis in order to identify um, a specific treatable condition is absolutely warranted because there will be kids, for example, um, who have uh, an emerging bipolar disorder the DBT will still help them manage affect, um, but they still may need medication management for a biologically driven mood uh, instability. Um, and there will be limits to what the DBT can do without the uh, medical intervention. Um, but it's precisely because of the complexity of, of differential diagnosis that you want to kind of slow things down, uh, but uh, still equip them with the DBT skills, especially since the high prevalence of adverse childhood experience exposures to kids, specifically in juvenile justice. Do you have anything you want to add to that, Yvonne? Or? No, I think that's a good point. I mean, we do have um, psychiatrists that can fall with our programs. We do have kids on psychotropic medications. We do assessments. So, yes, both are very much needed. Thanks both. Um, one, Yvonne, I'll stick with you here. Uh, how have you modified DBT for the use of lower IQs, TBI, and prenatal alcohol exposure, or have you modified it? We, we have certainly tried. We have um, some, some forms that are like color-coded so that I didn't bring them. If people are interested, I could send them out so that they, they you know, when you're in a green state, you're feeling in control so that they're able to share, you know, just like a stoplight, red, yellow, green, along that line. We have a lot of activities that we use with kids. So that, you know, stress balls, uh, yoga, so that we do a lot of nonverbal as well. Another thing that we do is if a, our, our, our groups are ongoing, so if the youth goes into a program, they may start the third week into a mindfulness group. So what we will do in their, for the first group, we will have kids that are really good at the earlier skills pair up and uh, practice with them. Because it's a nice way for a youth when they're first entering your group to have known a few of the other peers that are going to be in that group. And often kids do a great job of explaining to each other when they understand it. So we've done um, kind of different techniques. We have uh, some kids, surprising, really can uh, be settled naturally by music or by art, so that we try to have a lot of nonverbal uh, techniques to also teach self-regulation. And you mentioned activities in there, and I actually had a, a question earlier that I saw in our questions about um, what types of activities. Could you give maybe some, do you have any other examples of some of the activities that they're doing? Um, Um, <laughs> well, often uh, we'll have packets for kids. So let's say if they're on repair. So they will have a packet. And depending on, um, they can have dress balls. They can uh, color medallions. They can uh, work to think about a skill that's helpful to them. And they can do a skit so that they can teach it to other peers. 
they can role play how they might have used that and avoided the situation. So there's, um, there's individualized activities. There's also, I mean, it's surprising. I thought girls would like yoga, but the boys in the programs that have used yoga, there's one program that does Tai Chi. So there's a number of ways to kind of teach this in nonverbal ways as well. Uh, I've also heard of programs who use um, structured group activities. One way of putting it, what it looks like is adolescent boys doing drumming. Yeah. Because if you think about it, when you get a group of people who are doing rhythmic drumming together, um, they are cooperating together, they're having to listen carefully, and you can see these kids, many of whom come into the drumming session very tightly wrapped. Uh, and by the time they get out of half an hour or 45 minutes of, of doing the, the hand drumming, uh, they are much more relaxed, they are interacting with each other and with staff in, in much more straightforward and pleasant ways. And uh, particularly for kids who do not learn well through verbal means, you can achieve the same end often by either replacing a verbally mediated learning activity with a nonverbal one, or uh, even kids who have trouble with language and processing can do better. Not that they can't learn it, it's just going to take them longer and they're going to need some more individual support uh, and practice in order to get there. A lot of questions about DBT, so I'm going to stick with it here. and um, uh, I'll try to get two for one on this question from two different people, kind of similar about staff and when you were getting staff trained on this. Uh, what are some things or maybe some struggles that you had uh, getting staff buy-in when you made the transition to DBT? And have you adjusted your job descriptions or at all around hiring professionals that are working with the kids now that you've done this? Yes. People initially had concerns that, you know, we were too soft on kids. Uh, you know, there needed to be more consequences. I think that as kids have responded and the units are safer and there's more of a dialogue with kids, that um, one staff member not too long ago said that you could tell when people were hired, we hired really big <laughs> we don't need to do that anymore. We may or we may not. You know, I mean, there's just less restraint. And then the other question, I think there were two questions. Change the job description. Um, we certainly, when we put out our um, bids for programs, we make it very clear that staff are to be trained in DBT. It's a required activity. Um, we have certainly I'm the director of clinical services, so the clinician's job descriptions have changed so that they need to learn this within six months. I think in terms of line staff, I know there's been times they're like, um, that's not in my job description, but we slowly, um, for, the, for the majority, it's, it's, it's working. And then we very much have a part of basic training, so you know going in, that's an element of it. Looks like a lot of people want to get started on this, or at least interested in getting started with using DBT or what the next steps might be. Did you uh, run into any copyright issues trying to get DBT working in the, the state? Or you had mentioned that you shared this with Marsha Linehan. Uh, Back in what 2009. Were, what were her th thoughts on it, and how are you doing it in the state? Um, it was I worked with Helen Vest, who was working with Marsha Linehan at the time, and her comment, she really liked the manual. They said, go for it. But what we have done is we also feel very much that we, we want to teach at PPT and that we have our clinicians trained on it. So that it's, it's part of it is very much you know, kind of homegrown. We've had a lot of staff contribute to the manual. But we also make sure that we are you know, following basic PPT. Do you have any other suggestions for people that want to get started? They. Um, feel free to call me. I mean, I've seen it work really well with a lot of kids. Or at least call here, and you guys can. <laughs> Absolutely. We'd like to take the call okay. right here. The one thing that I would just want to add is um, uh, I can certainly understand why Marshall and her colleagues would be extremely eager. Uh, they also have learned on the adult side that they need, they, they, they need to have in place the kinds of things that DYS did like uh, carefully adhering to the principles while they modified it and doing the research to make sure that it was doing what it was going to do. Because they learned on the adult side that there were people who would start doing DBT on various units with adults on them 
Um, but then they very rapidly uh, kind of made up more stuff as they went along. The, the technical doom for it is that they lost fidelity to the model. And so by the time somebody came back and saw it again, a year or two years later, they were still calling it DBT, but the main features of DBT had been so changed that it probably wasn't anymore. So the only caution that I would have is if, you, if you're going to do it, do it by the book, because otherwise you'll have something called DBT. It may not be working, and you'll be thinking that it's the DBT that's not working. Um, and in fact, doing it by the book will probably get you the results that we've got at DYS with, with Yvonne and her colleagues. And a great point, and it's coming up on the 3 o'clock hour, so I just want to thank you both. And we do have some questions that we didn't have time for today, but uh, we'll be sure to follow up with each of you that ask questions and see if we can get answers to you. And also, uh, we'll be sure to follow up with everybody with follow-up emails. Uh, we'll make sure that the PowerPoint slides are made available. And again, today's session is being recorded, so if you want to go back and watch the presentation, you can do so. Uh, we'll be holding our next CJCA webinar on Friday, October 17th, just about one month from now. And the subject is Earn to Learn, the PAC program developed in the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, presenting will be the director in Pennsylvania, Michael Pennington, from the Pennsylvania Bureau of Juvenile Justice. So save that date, and we'll send you the registration information once it becomes available. Also, be sure to follow CJCA on your favorite social networks. You can find us on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn. Twitter, and also follow our blog. Lots of information is available on our blog, the Juvenile Justice News, as well as work going on in programs and facilities. So check that out as well. When you leave today's webinar, be sure to take our five-question survey. We should just take you a minute or two to complete the survey. Your feedback is really important to us, and we appreciate you uh, taking the time to do that. And we certainly appreciate you taking the time to be with us here today. So on behalf of our panelists, my name is Brenda Donahue. And uh, from the rest of CJCA, thank you, and have a great weekend. Bye-bye.